All right, let's uh, let's dive into this report on quantum computing in Canada. This is the deep dive, and well, our mission today is to take this source. It's called State of Quantum Computing in Canada, a 2025 report, and really pull out the key nuggets for you. Yeah, try and get a clear picture of where Canada actually stands, right? <laughs> because things move so fast in this field. Exactly. What's this report telling us about Canada aiming to be uh, a quantum first country? And just for context, the report's author, Candice Gilhooly, she co-hosts the Impact Quantum podcast. So, you know, she's deep in this world. Right. And I think what jumps out immediately, right from the get-go, is how um, how coordinated the whole thing seems. It's not just like one project here or there. It looks like government, industry, academia. Mm -hmm. They're all sort of pushing together. Yeah, the report really emphasizes that. It starts right at the top, doesn't it? Like at the G7 summit back in June 2025. Uh-huh. Canada apparently put quantum computing right up there as a key pillar. Alongside AI and energy transition, I saw. Exactly. Big priorities. And Prime Minister Mark Carney, he specifically mentioned its role in uh, economic growth, energy resilience, and importantly, cybersecurity. At that level of visibility, G7 level, that says a lot. It really does. Signals it's, you know, strategically vital for them. And that leads into this new agency they set up, right? Borealis. Yes, Borealis. Uh, the Bureau of Research, Engineering, and Advanced Leadership in Innovation and Science. Bit of a mouthful. Huh, yeah. But the report describes it as um, a dedicated agency, specifically for supporting that frontier R&D, quantum, AI, cyber, defense applications. And a key thing noted is this focus on dual-use innovation. Meaning stuff for civilian and defense use. Exactly. And also technological sovereignty. Yeah. Making sure Canada, you know, keeps control over this critical tech. Okay, so it's not just throwing money around, it's directed, strategic. Precisely. And it connects directly to the National Quantum Strategy update from earlier in 2025. Right, the update with the big funding number, CAD, $360 million. That's the one. And the breakdown is interesting. The report says $141 million for research, $45 million for talent, and uh, $169 million for commercialization. Okay, so commercialization gets the biggest slice. Why is that significant? Well, think about it. Research is crucial, obviously. Foundational stuff. And talent, you absolutely need the people, right? Uh, places like University of Sherbrooke offering quantum degrees, that's key. But putting the most money into commercialization, that shows a really clear intention. You want to get things to market. Exactly. It's yeah. not just about leading in research. It's about translating it into you know, economic impact, mm. jobs, real applications, fast. The strategy talks about ecosystem hubs, academic partnerships, sure. But the money really points towards those commercialization pipelines. Get it out of the lab. Okay, that makes sense. So let's shift to the industry side then. Quantum Industry Canada, QIC gets mentioned. Right, QIC, they're basically the industry association. Okay. They've been pushing hard for this national leadership role. The report actually quotes this uh, pretty striking estimate from them. The GDP and jobs one. Yeah. They think quantum could be 3% of Canada's GDP and create over 200,000 jobs by, like, 2045. Wow, that's ambitious. That's huge potential, right? And QIC, according to the report, they're happy with the government's recent moves, but they also stress focusing on secure supply chains. Making sure the building blocks are safe and reliable. Uh-huh, which is crucial. And it seems like the private money is flowing, too. The report mentions a big jump in investment in 2025. Yeah, surge. Said something like over 70% of the expected annual funding closed in just the first half of the year. 70% in six months. That's serious momentum. It absolutely is. Shows real investor confidence. And there's a specific example, too, Rigetti Computing. Oh, yeah, the U.S. company with Canadian links. That's them. They launched a U.S. $350 million capital offering. And the report notes it was specifically to scale up their superconducting hardware. That's the really complex, super cold tech, right? Yep, needs incredible engineering. So $350 million just to scale the hardware. It yeah. gives you a sense of the investment scale we're talking about. And speaking of hardware, D-Wave, out on the West Coast, they had a big announcement mention. They did. D-Wave announced they'd achieved uh, what they call practical quantum advantage. Right, practical quantum advantage, that phrase. It sounds important, but I know it's kind of debated. What does the report say it means here? So in this context, the report explains it as D-Wave claiming their specific machine, a quantum annealer, can solve certain real-world optimization problems. Like logistics or materials problems? Yes, finding the best route, best mix, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. Faster or better than top classical computers, specifically for like practical business uses. Okay. And the debate? Well, the debate is often about 
which problems really show this, how much faster it really is versus the latest classical algorithms and whether it's, you know, a fundamental breakthrough or more of a specialized win for their type of machine. I see. But the report makes a good point. Regardless of that debate, D-Wave's milestone signals real-world traction. It suggests their devices are starting to show actual utility for businesses, even if it's near-term potential for now. So moving beyond pure theory into actual problem solving, even if it's niche for now. Exactly, which connects nicely to how academia and industry are working together. Yeah, the report highlights a few partnerships, like Xanadu with the government and U of T. Right, Xanadu, the National Research Council, the NRC, and the University of Toronto. Their project, detailed in the report, is about using quantum algorithms to simulate lithium-ion battery materials. Ah, okay, for better batteries, essentially. Precisely, trying to improve energy storage performance. Huh. Huge implications for EVs, grid storage, all that. It's a great example of applying quantum to a major real-world challenge. And universities are busy beyond just that specific project, right? UBC hosted a conference. Uh, AQC 2025, that's adiabatic quantum computing. The conference brought together global experts on that approach, which is related to D-Ways annealing. They also focused on hybrid algorithms, mixing quantum and classical and near-term applications you could actually run soon. Hosting stuff like that puts Canada on the map as a global hub for this dialogue. And none of this works without people, obviously. Talent development gets mentioned. Absolutely crucial. Places like University of Sherbrooke setting up dedicated quantum degrees. Mm. That's building the pipeline. And the national labs, like NRC, they keep doing vital foundational work. Things like um, quantum error correction, which is super hard control systems, simulation algorithms. It feels like all this activity is clustered in certain spots, though. The report maps out these regional hubs. Yeah, there are definite clusters. You've got Waterloo, Ontario Institute for Quantum Computing, IQC, Lazarita Center, major research place. Right, the big names. Then Toronto, you've got Xanadu, the hardware company, plus the Creative Destruction Lab's Quantum Stream, that's a startup accelerator. Okay. Vancouver's home base for D-Wave, the annealer folks, and also 1Qubit doing quantum software. And Montreal. Montreal's interesting. Yeah. Collaborations with Milo, the big AI institute there, so you get AI and quantum mixing, plus strong work in quantum cryptography, secure communications. You mentioned some key companies there, D-Wave, mm. Xanadu, 1Qbit. The report singles them out, too. It does. So besides D-Wave, you have Xanadu focusing on photonic quantum computing using light. They have a cloud platform, got DARPA funding. Photonic, right. Different approach. Yeah. And then 1Qbit, which the report says specializes in quantum-inspired algorithms mm -hmm. for finance, healthcare, complex stuff. Okay. Quantum-inspired. That sounds different from building the actual quantum computer. What's the distinction the report makes there? Yeah, it's an important difference. True quantum computing, like what Xanadu or D-Wave aim for, uses actual quantum properties, superposition, entanglement in the hardware. Cribbit's doing things classical bits can't. Right. Quantum-inspired algorithms, they run on classical computers, like your standard laptop or server, mm -hmm. but they use ideas, techniques, maybe structures borrowed or inspired by quantum computing concepts. Oh, okay. The goal is to maybe solve certain problems better than traditional classical methods, leveraging those quantum ideas, but without needing actual quantum hardware yet. The report positions one qubit in that space, clever algorithms for today's machines. Got it. So one qubit uses the ideas for now Xanadu and D-Wave build the future hardware. Clear. Okay, so looking ahead, what's the report's outlook? It gives a short-term and a medium-term view. Short-term, like the next 6-12 months, the big thing is Borealis starting to issue RFPs, funding calls, basically turning strategy into funded projects. Keeping things off. Exactly. We should also see the first results from that Xanadu NRCU of T battery project, a tangible early outcome. And Montreal's hosting a Quantum Now W Summit to get industry and government even more aligned. Okay, funding starts, first results trickle in. What about medium term, say, the next one to three years? That's when the report expects to see more quantum pilot programs really expanding, testing quantum solutions in defense, pharma, material science, real-world trials. It also predicts, you know, continued growth in private investment, building on that surge, and more actual commercialization of the hardware platforms being built. Sounds like a logical progression. Strategy, funding, pilots, market growth. But it can't all be smooth sailing. The report must mention risks, challenges. Oh, definitely. It's quite clear-eyed about the hurdles. The big fundamental physics one is still quantum decoherence, keeping those quantum states stable long enough to compute. Error correction is just really, really hard. The basic science is still tough. Absolutely. 
Then there's intense global competition. Yeah. The U.S., China, U.K., Europe. Everyone's pouring money into this. Right. It's a race. It is. And related to that is the need for secure IP and supply chains, protecting innovations, ensuring Canada maintains that technological sovereignty Borealis is aiming for. Okay, so let's try and synthesize this. What's the core message you take away from this 2025 report? I think the main takeaway is that Canada has very deliberately decided to be a quantum first country. It's not just drifting into it. You've got this aligned national strategy. You've got serious government backing with Borealis. You see industry momentum, big investments, D-Wave's advantage claim, and this strong academic base in those hubs. It feels like they're building a whole ecosystem designed not just to play, but potentially to lead globally. And why should you, listening, care about these specifics? Well, knowing about Borealis, the funding numbers, that battery project, who Xanadu or D-Wave or 1Qubit are, where the hubs are, it paints a really concrete picture. It shows you how quantum is moving from you know, physics labs into becoming a national strategic priority with real stuff happening now in a country that's right at the forefront. Yeah, it gives you the details you need to actually track the progress, understand what's real and what's hype. So given these rapid short-term developments we expect, Borealis funding, those project results, and the huge long-term potential the report outlines, here's something for you to think about. How much will those fundamental challenges, the physics of decoherence, the fierce global competition, how much will they truly shape Canada's ability to actually achieve that leadership ambition in the next few years? Is the current strategy and momentum enough to overcome those really tough technical hurdles and win out in the global race? Something to mull over.